For much of history, medical knowledge about what caused illness and how to cure it was quite limited. People including many physicians often turned to remedies that made sense to them at the time, but that we now know were useless, counterproductive, and when seen through modern eyes outright bizarre. Following are 20 fascinating things about weird health beliefs and cures from history. Number 20. Coal-Fueled Steam Vibrators The late 19th century's medical community believed that there was a female hysteria epidemic, some leading physicians estimated that up to three out of every four American women suffered from the malady. However, the cure of inducing female paroxysm in patients was a time-consuming task. It was difficult to teach and learn. Doctors complained that it often took an hour or more. And many suffered wrist fatigue carpal tunnel syndrome, as we would call it today. In a nutshell, doctors were getting sore wrists from fingering female patients to orgasm. So physicians began turning to mechanical vibrators, the first steam-powered vibrator, fueled by packing coal into a furnace, was invented in 1869. However, such vibrators were bulky and cumbersome contraptions, some as big as a dining room table. They took up too much space in doctors' offices, and were too cumbersome to tote around in a medical kit back for house visits. Number 19. Inventing the Modern Vibrator The problem of two cumbersome vibrators was finally solved by Hamilton Beach, the makers of kitchen appliances such as coffee makers, toasters, and blenders, in 1902 they marketed the Try New Life, the world's first commercially available vibrator, because of the conventional mores of the day. The devices could not be advertised for what they actually were, instead, they were marketed as electrical massagers to ease sore and aching muscles. Some people probably did buy them in order to ease sore and aching muscles, however, it was very much a wink-wink nudge-nudge situation, the devices were marketed to women, the overwhelming majority of purchasers were women, and it was common knowledge among women just what the vibrators were for. Number 18. Overprescribing Opium During the American Civil War The United States Civil War was the country's bloodiest, about 10% of all northern males, and 30% of all southern males perished in the conflict. Modern estimates put the war's fatalities at between 785,000 to 1 million deaths the latter figure representing 3.2% of America's then population, if extrapolated to 2020 population estimates, it would be the equivalent of about 10,600,000 deaths. It was one of the first major modern wars and one in which advances in weaponry outpaced advances in battlefield tactics. The result was high casualties and horrific injuries that confronted the Army's physicians with unprecedented challenges, the standard of medical care and state of medical knowledge were abysmally low by modern standards, so it is perhaps unsurprising that Civil War-era doctors did not fully appreciate drug addiction and its risks. They prescribed morphine and other opium derivatives like candy. The result was a massive post-war addiction, little reported but as devastating as any modern drug addiction epidemic. Number 17. Prescribing Opium for Constipation Civil War physicians might not have known about antiseptic practices to prevent infections, however, Thanks to the recent invention of the hypodermic needle coupled with the discovery of morphine decades earlier, they could at least do something to ease the pain of wounded soldiers. And when hypodermic needles and morphine were unavailable, opium pills were in plentiful supply at least in Union hospitals. So soldiers were often dosed with massive amounts of morphine, or opium to deaden the pain of amputations, other surgeries and various ailments. There were plenty of wartime accounts highlighting liberality in dispensing drugs, one Union doctor diagnosed wounded soldiers from horseback, and if any needed morphine, the doctor would pour a dose on his hand and have the soldier lick it. On the Confederate side, one rebel doctor was known for giving any patient a plug of opium, depending on whether or not he was constipated. Number 16. A Massive Post-War Addiction Epidemic Back in the mid-19th century, the potential for drug addiction was little known, and even among those who knew, the risk was deemed acceptable. When dealing with the immediate pressing problems of treating the civil wars injured and sick, the risk of future morphine and opium addiction down the road were seen lesser evils that could be dealt with later. Later came when the soldiers were discharged from the hospitals. It is estimated that over 400,000 civil war became morphine addicts because of their wartime experiences. The term soldier's disease was coined to describe that addiction. Many addicts were readily identifiable by a small bag dangling from a leather thong around their neck, containing morphine tablets and a hypodermic needle. It is perhaps unsurprising that the most chaotic and violent period of the Wild West occurred within a few years of the Civil War's end. That was when many war veterans still struggling with addiction began arriving in the West. 
Number 15. When yanking teeth was a great wedding gift. Visiting the dentist is not exactly an enjoyable experience, however visiting a dentist today is nothing like the horrors that used to pass for dentistry back in the day. For example in 19th century England, dental hygiene standards were abysmal, and teeth frequently went bad in early adulthood, so each time a tooth rotted, it entailed a visit to the neighborhood barber surgeon, who yanked it out with pliers without anesthetic. To spare their kids the misery of having to go through that kind of pain several times in their lifetimes, some parents opted for full teeth removal as a present to their offspring when they grew up. Full teeth removal meant exactly that, yanking out all the teeth from the mouth and replacing them with dentures. Full teeth removal was considered such a fine gift that it was frequently given to brides as a wedding present. Number 14. Early 20th Century Viagra Boat Testicle Implants Men care about their penises as probably as great an understatement as has ever been uttered. Men have always worried about their family jewels, and throughout history, there has never been a shortage of those eager to cash in on such concerns, not least when it comes to the ability or in this case the inability to get it up. Before Viagra came along and ruined the party for many charlatans, quack doctors, witch doctors, and self-declared witches and sorcerers had a field day peddling cures for those complaining of sexual malaise even today, despite medical breakthroughs in treating erectile dysfunction, a plausible promise to improve men's penises, combined with savvy marketing, is one of the easiest moneymakers out there, however few penis problem cure charlatans were as brazen, or as successful as the doctor who made a bundle implanting goat testicles into men's sacks. Number 13. The Goat Glands Doctor Throughout history, few have ever made as much out of problematic penis fixes as did Dr. John R. Brinkley, he became known as the Goat Glands Doctor, but might be better thought of as the Goat Testicles Transplant Doctor, the doctor is in quotes because Brinkley simply bought a medical degree from Diploma Mill, then began practicing medicine after moving to Milford, Kansas, where he opened a clinic specializing in men's sexual performance. For $25, Brinkley injected his patients with nothing more than colored water, plus a promise that it would turn them into demons in bed. Like many charlatans, Brinkley demonstrated that a con man need not be brilliant, so long as the marks are dumb, are willing to suspend disbelief due to wishful thinking, or are too embarrassed to admit that they had been conned, the con man can have his way with them, early successes at least successes in getting the marks to part with their money, not successes in curing their erectile dysfunction, emboldened Brinkley into upping his game, so he began peddling the ultimate erectile dysfunction, goat testicle implants. Number 12. Why not? Dr. Brinkley's sexual performance cures were clearly bunk, and at best had a placebo effect with some patients, whose problems were psychological rather than physical. However, between his tireless self-promotion, over-the-top personality and his Marx eagerness to believe, Brinkley soon developed a reputation as a miracle worker in restoring penises to tip-top performance, one day in 1918 a patient walked into Brinkley's clinic, complaining about trouble getting it up, the doctor cracked a joke about how the man would have no problem if he had goat's testicles, goats having a particular reputation back then for virility, at some point after doctor and patient stopped laughing, they figured why not, and decided to go ahead and put goat balls in the man's testes, Brinkley even offered the man $150 if he went along with the experiment. Number 11. The Goat Balls God Brinkley's patient claimed that all was well after goat gonads had been implanted in his testicular sac, so Brinkley publicized the success of the operation, hoping to drum up many more patients willing to pay for goat testicle transplants. Soon, Brinkley was performing up to 100 transplant operations a week in his clinic, charging his patients $750, about $10,000 in 2020 dollars, per crude procedure simply placed the goat gonads within a man's testicle sac and the patient's body would then typically absorb the goat tissue as foreign matter. Medically speaking, the operation had no impact whatsoever, other than the occasional infection, but there was no shortage of patients convincing themselves, or at least going out of their way to convince others, that they were now as virile as goats, those who were not were typically too embarrassed to open themselves to ridicule, for failing to get it up even with goat balls. Number 10. Bring your own goat Brinkley's goat testicle implants procedure became so popular that his schedule became jam-packed. Patients began bringing their own goats, personally selected by them after observing their prowess, to implant their gonads in their testes. Brinkley's popularity kept growing, despite the fact that many of his patients came down with infections, and quite a few died, 
that was unsurprising, in addition to inadequate medical training, Brinkley's surgery was poorly sterilized, and he often operated on patients while drunk. However, his popularity kept growing, and increased even further after he put on a show for the press in 1920, during which he performed 34 goat testicle transplants, the press and public ate it up, he hired an advertising agent, who coined the phrase that Brinkley's procedure turned hapless men into the ram that am with every lamb. Number 9. The Anal Testicle Implant Craze Brinkley's goat testicle implants were not unique at the time. He had a rival, who specialized in transplanting monkey balls into men's testicles. However, goat gonads caught on more than monkey balls, and as Brinkley's fame grew, he widened the list of ailments cured by his procedure to include flatulence, dementia and cancer. By 1922 Brinkley was a celebrity, and he traveled to LA to perform a transplant on a Los Angeles Times editor, while in California, he made over $40,000 serious money back then, from surgeries performed on Hollywood stars. Brinkley liked the West Coast so much, he decided to set up a practice there, complete with a goat farm. However, the California Medical Board denied him a license after finding his resume was riddled with lies and discrepancies. Undaunted, Brinkley returned to Kansas and expanded his Milford Clinic. Number 8. Pioneering Radio Advertising Synergy The Better to Scam the Gullible Whatever his shortcomings as a doctor, and those shortcomings were legion, Brinkley was a savvy entrepreneur who quickly grasped the potential of the then, new medium of radio, in 1923 he bought what came to be America's fourth biggest radio station, KFKB chiefly to market his medical practice. Before long, Brinkley was prescribing medications to his listeners. People would write him, with $2 included in the envelope, and he would diagnose them on air then prescribe a medication. The medication was typically only available in a Brinkley-owned pharmacy, or one with whom he had cut a deal for a cut of their profits. However, all good things come to an end, and in 1923 California tried to extradite Brinkley, however Kansas governor refused to hand him over. Number 7. Organized Charlatanism Brinkley's political pull in Kansas saved him saved from extradition to California, however, bad press especially from a rival radio station on a mission to expose Brinkley as a fraud, continued to hound the good gonads doctor, his popularity began to decline after stories emerged that his operating room was often filthy and that Brinkley frequently performed surgery while intoxicated. By 1930, it had emerged that Brinkley had signed over 40 death certificates for patients who had died during his goat testicle transplants. As a result, Kansas Medical Board revoked his license, stating that Brinkley has performed an organized charlatanism quite beyond the invention of the humble mountebank. Number 6. Running for governor to get re-licensed as a doctor Things went from bad to worse for Brinkley, six months after he lost his license to practice medicine, the Federal Radio Commission, predecessor of today's FCC, refused to renew Brinkley's radio station's license. The federal agency determined that the famous doctor's broadcasts were mostly advertising, in violation of his radio license, as well as being obscene and against the public interest. The twin blows from the state and federal authorities put a major crimp on Brinkley's cash flow, and things quickly began to go south for him, other than appeal, there was little he could do about the lost radio license. However, to get the medical license back, Brinkley hit upon an ingenious solution. Run for governor of Kansas. As governor, he could appoint his own members to the medical board and thus get his license back. Number 5. End of the road for the goat gonads guru. Brinkley launched his campaign for governor just three days after losing his medical license. He ran on a vague platform of public works, lower taxes, higher old age, pensions, and education. Despite being a near last minute write in candidate, Brinkley got almost 30% of the vote. He would have won, but the state's attorney general intervened at the last minute to change the rules for write in votes. Only those writing Brinkley's name as J.R. Brinkley would have their votes counted. That disqualified 50,000 Brinkley ballots that would put have put him over the top had they been counted. Brinkley ran again in 1932 but lost. He then faded away, pursued by numerous medical malpractice and wrongful death lawsuits. By the time John R. Brinkley died in 1942, he was bankrupt. Number 4. The Healing Properties of Poop Ancient Egyptians swore by the healing properties of gazelle, donkey, dog, and fly dung, and the ability of those animals' droppings to ward off evil spirits. They also used animal poop to heal their wounds. On the one hand, that might have caused tetanus and other infections on occasion. 
especially when applying poop to wounds. On the other hand, the microflora in some animal dung contains antibiotics, so the remedy might actually have worked every now and then. The ancient Greeks borrowed a lot from the Egyptians, including the medical prescription for using crocodile poop as birth control. Ancient Greek women believed that inserting crocodile dung in their vaginas would serve as a powerful contraceptive. Who knows, perhaps it actually worked, at least in the sense that encountering a vagina full of crocodile poop might have been such a huge turnoff that it averted sex from occurring in the first place. Number 3. The Cow Manure Cure Heraclitus of Ephesus was an ancient Greek philosopher, who advanced the notion that the essence of the universe is constant change. To that end, he coined the phrase no man ever steps into the same river twice in recognition of the notion that everything, like the ever-moving droplets of water drifting downstream on a river, is in constant motion and flux, even if the motion is not readily perceptible. Heraclitus also propagated the notion of a unity of opposites, whereby the universe is a system of balanced exchanges in which, all things are paired in a relationship with those things exhibiting contrary properties. Unfortunately, he is probably best known nowadays for the bizarre cure he prescribed himself to cure an illness. Coating himself in cow dung, it ended up killing him. Number 2. A Great AA Hole Heraclitus was a highly introspective man, he did not come by his philosophy through learning at the hands of another philosopher, but was self-taught, critical of other philosophers, Heraclitus had a dim view of humanity, and loathed mobs and democracy, preferring instead rule by a few wise men, a concept that Plato later distilled into the notion that the ideal ruler would be a philosopher king, deeming wealth a form of punishment, Heraclitus wished upon his fellow Ephesians, whom he hated, that they would be cursed with wealth as punishment for their sins. In short Heraclitus was a misanthrope, his misanthropy led him to avoid contact with other people for long stretches, during which he wandered alone through mountains and wilderness, surviving on plants and what he could scavenge, as Diogenes summed him up. Finally, Heraclitus became a hater of his kind and roamed the mountains, surviving on grass and herbs. Number 1. What a way to go! Heraclitus the philosopher's long and interesting life came to a weird end, as a result of his affliction with dropsy, or edema a painful accumulation of fluids beneath the skin and in the body's cavities, however it was not the illness that killed him, but the cure, Healers could offer him neither cure nor relief so Heraclitus, the self-taught philosopher sought to apply his self-teaching skills to medicine and heal himself. He tried an innovative cure by covering himself in cow dung Heraclitus theorized that the warmth of the manure would dry, and draw out of him the noxious damp humor, where the fluids accumulated beneath his skin, covering himself in cow manure, Heraclitus lay out in the sun to dry, only to be immobilized by the cow dung drying around him into a body cast. He was thus unable to shoo off a pack of dogs that came upon him, and ended up eating the philosopher alive.